Coming up on this episode of the Hockey Nuts, Steve and I get you caught up with all of the player transactions that have been going on since we last recorded. Free agency and player signings are the big part of the news this time of year, and every team is working hard to fill all of their vacant roster spots. We also continue our team-by-team team season previews this week, and this week we'll be focusing on the Central Division. We'll have all the details of all this, plus the Minor League Minute and our Picks of the Week coming up next. This is the Hockey Nuts Podcast, Season 2, Episode 5. Recorded on Wednesday, September 13th, 2017. Central Division Preview. Shut up and sit down. Hello and welcome to Episode 5 of Season 2 of the Hockey Nuts Podcast. My name is Wayne. I'm here with Steve. How's it going today, Steve? Going great, Wayne. Good to be with you. Uh, another great week to talk about hockey, I tell you. I'm pumped. And I don't know if you noticed, but uh, this is a bit of a milestone for us. I know Season 2, Episode 5 doesn't seem to be a whole lot newsworthy, but it's actually our 50th episode. Wow, that is really... Uh, that's that's us. I, that is, I didn't know that. Since we started doing this, what, just over a year ago? Yeah. Yeah. Wow. So, been yeah. A, it's, it's been a lot of fun. I, I, <laughs> this is a blast. Yeah, we're, <laughs> we're having a fun talking hockey, and, and, we're, and we're getting even more excited because uh, the, the uh, training camps, actually, most teams, the players report tomorrow. Is today, of course, is Wednesday the uh, 13th, and tomorrow the 14th. Thursday, most players or most teams have their players reporting to training camp. Yeah. And I know, I don't know about the Western Conference, but I was looking at an article on the NHL.com today that on the Eastern Conference, every team in the Eastern Conference has their first practice on Friday. I would, wow. I would imagine that the Western Conference is going to be the same. They probably have that in the, in the CBA. That's why all the teams are starting up all on the same day. Uh, but yeah, practices start Friday. Yeah, that's great. That's great news. And the first preseason games are probably within a couple of days after that. They don't, they don't waste time like like they do in other sports. As soon <laughs> as they start practicing, they start playing games. So, um, yeah. so yeah, preseason is here. We are, I think, less than three days away for the, from the first preseason games. I think, I think Saturday is the first game. There's one game Saturday. Yeah, you're every, right. And then everybody else has a bunch. A whole bunch of games on Sunday preseason. Yeah, I I think the Vegas Golden Knights uh, got a matinee game on Sunday that's going to be on TV, and I I'm probably going to watch that. I, if I'm not mistaken, it's from T-Mobile Arena. Yeah. So I plan on tuning that in and watching, see how yeah. they do. So it's going to be going to be very exciting uh, coming up because uh, we're get finally getting back to NHL action. Yeah. Um, but with that, we've got a lot to talk about tonight. I know it's only been, what, six days since we last recorded, but we're back on our regular Wednesday night schedule. Um, and this week will be week two of our four-week series previewing all 31 NHL teams. So we've got to uh, talk about that. And tonight we're going to be talking about the Central Division. Yes. So this is this is now officially the smallest division in the NHL. It's the only division left. With just seven teams. Everybody else has eight. That's uh, right. And I may throw my two cents in a little bit later on in the podcast, Wayne, and we'll talk about things um, uh, like the Saddle Dome and et cetera, et cetera. But we'll, we'll talk. But uh, yep. Yep. Uh, it got, is right now the, the smallest division in hockey. You're right. It sure is. Um, so anyway, so we've got uh, all of that to talk about and we've got some news that's come up We've um, and some not so news. <laughs> In terms of uh, there's there's just a few players left that are that are restricted free agents that haven't signed yet. And uh, there's one big headliner with the Bruins that still hasn't signed. We'll talk about his situation and then we'll also uh, touch on all the other uh, restricted free agents that have yet to sign. But anyway, before we get going, let's uh, take a pause real brief just to remind you that you can find our show just about anywhere you can get podcasts. Uh, at plus some additional areas. First and foremost, you can find us at thehockeywriters.com. Uh, that's a, a website that has a lot of hockey content uh, by professional journalists and amateur journalists like ourselves. 
as well. Uh, and they have a podcast channel or a, p- a page that lists a whole bunch of hockey related podcasts. And we are on that as well. And you can find that at the hockeywriters.com. You can find us right on our website at the hockey um, You can find us through just about any app that uh, you get your, uh, your podcast from you, anywhere from iTunes, Stitcher, SoundCloud, iHeartRadio, tune in Google play music, uh, the uh, Apple, whatever they call it now. I don't have an iPhone, so I don't know what it's called. <laughs> the Apple Podcast app, I think, is what it's called. Yeah. Um, yeah. There's there's a bunch of different places you can find us. Basically, do a search for the Hockey Nuts. You're sure to find us right there. We have the big triangular-shaped blue uh, blue and white logo. It's pretty easy to find. And that's something I've been meaning to work on, too, is getting our logo changed. Steve and I have a great picture of the two of us with the Stanley Cup from earlier this spring that I'm yeah. going to be incorporating <laughs> into our new logo. I just need to uh, find the time to work on that. So, yeah. Um, But, uh, yeah, we've got some uh, good pictures there for that. But anyway, uh, you can also support the show by sharing it with everyone you know. Uh, retweeting it, you, uh, you know, all kinds of uh, ways to get involved with the show that way. Um, we always encourage our listeners to um, give us some feedback. You can reach us at feedback at com. You can tweet us. Uh, I'm at Wayne Halley 9. Steve is at sball 504 man. Uh, you can reach us through our Facebook page at facebook.com slash the hockey nuts. Uh, we actually have a YouTube channel. That uh, when we record, we often live stream, and we are tonight, we're live streaming the recording of that, so you can actually watch us make the sausage, so so to speak. So uh, right. you can find us right on our YouTube channel. I've got a shortcut set up for that. Just go to ho- thehockeynuts.com slash YouTube, and that will just forward you right to our uh, YouTube channel. Uh, if you wanted to financially support us, we have two great ways to do that. You can... Uh, support us through our two affiliate links that we've got set up. One is with Amazon, um, and the other one is with HockeyMonkey.com. And the HockeyMonkey.com one is the um, is a website for folks that actually are involved with the game, whether you or a family member is a hockey player, coach, uh, referee, whatever you are, you can get all your gear in order to be involved in the game at that level uh, right at, at HockeyMonkey.com. And, uh, and, of course, everybody knows what Amazon is and what they do. So uh, in order to financially support us, all you have to do is just go to thehockeynuts.com, click on the affiliate links on the right-hand side of the page. You'll see the ads for both Amazon and the Hockey Monkey. And click on those links, and it'll send you to those pages. And uh, just a small portion of any purchases you make at those two websites will come back to us. Uh, but you won't pay anything extra. So it's a great way to financially support us without having to cost you a dime. So um, so we appreciate those who've done that in the past, and, of course, we appreciate those who will do that in the future. All right. So with that aside, let's get going on some of the news and headlines of the week. Um, like I said at the top of the show, we've got our uh, Central Division preview to talk about. Uh, we'll talk about that later in the show. Uh, but we also need to talk about the rookie tournaments that have been going on, and most of them have been wrapped up um, already. Uh, we've got uh, more signings to talk about and uh, just a few other interesting stories that have come up uh, over the past several days. So first and foremost, let's get the signings out of the way and let, get everybody caught up with all of um, the signings that have happened over the past, um, uh, what, six, seven days or so. Yeah. All right, we last left off with what, who? Um, let's see, we last recorded when when? I get... Sam Bennett, right? Sam Bennett was the last guy, I yeah, believe. Yeah, we did talk correct. about him on the last show, so if you want to hear us uh, talk about that signing, you just hit us on episode four or last week's show and you'll be able to hear us talk about that so that brings us to september 7th and the next one we have we've got a couple of entry level ones uh first and foremost jacob middleton 21 year old defenseman signed with the san jose sharks signed an entry level contract three years 2.205 total value so it's an a- average cap hit of 735 per year um uh, probably a guy that will probably end up in the minor leagues to start and then uh, work his way to make on to the team. I don't know what you thought of that one. Um, I, I didn't uh, uh, really. I, it's it's an entry-level deal, and 
And uh, be honest with you, Wayne, that's all I know about it. I, I haven't followed Jacob Middleton. Yeah, he played for the Barracuda last year, had nine points in 50 games. Uh, probably will be destined for the Barracuda again this year. Um, and, uh, you know, we'll, we'll work to w- get his, you know, make a name for himself and try to get up to the NHL. Uh, that's pretty yeah. much all there is to say about him. Dmitry Samorakov, 18-year-old defenseman, signed with the Oilers yeah. on the 7th as well. Uh, three-year entry-level deal worth 2.775. That's an average right. cap hit of 886 per yeah. year. Uh, so a l- little bit of a higher-end player. He is only 18. Um, mm-hmm. This is probably one. Uh, he played 67 games with the Guelph Storm in the OHL last year. 20 yeah. points in 67 games. My guess is if he plays any games at the NHL level, he'll be one of those guys that plays in that where they're allowed to play up to nine games before they right. got to send him back to junior. Uh, you might see him in, in one or two games if he plays good enough. You're certainly going to see him in the preseason. Right. Um, and at some point, he will probably end up back in Guelph. Um, yep. He is only 18 years old, so. Um, but uh, he did sign for an 886, uh, 6'2", 181. So he's a little on the light size for how, uh, for how tall he is. So my yeah. expectation is he'll end up back in juniors, and and uh, uh, but he's a guy to uh, keep an eye on in the future if you're an Oilers fan. All right, next one is an NHL contract. Uh, Bo Horvat, 22-year-old center, signed a six-year, $33 million contract with the Vancouver Canucks. Yeah. Uh, his average cap hit was 5.5 per year. He was a restricted free agent, of course. And um, signing a six-year deal, obviously Vancouver likes him and wants yeah. to stick him around for a while. Right. Uh, you, you've got to say that they're pleased with him. Uh, $33 million commitment is a lot of money. Yep. Uh, five. Five point five million per season. Um, you know, I, I've I've seen Bo Horvat play, and uh, yep. you know, I, I don't keep tabs on the on the on the Canucks uh, to to be able to tell you ins and outs of all of his game. But uh, obviously, you know, when we come to talk about the future, uh, he's he's somebody that uh, that Vancouver believes is part of it. Yep. So uh, I, he's a twenty uh, goal scorer. He was drafted ninth overall in the first round in the twenty thirteen draft. So he's a high-end draft pick. He had 52 points last year in 81 games, 20 goals, 32 assists. He had 40 points in 82 games the year before that. Uh, so his numbers are still climbing, and his rookie year he had 25 points in 68 games. So his numbers are steadily improving. Mm-hmm. Um, but I think he's he's uh, you know a future um, cornerstone piece for for the rebuilding uh, Vancouver Canucks. They're, they're going to have another rebuilding year there. I don't expect them to do much of anything, but Bo Horvat is definitely a big part of their future. Right. All right, let's talk about Damon Severson. Yeah, that, that came off today, didn't it, Wayne? 23-year-old defenseman. Uh, was it today? It was just I'm a couple. Yeah, yes. se- yesterday, September 11th. Yeah. yeah. So two days ago, actually, now. Two days ago, yeah. yeah. Uh, 23-year-old defenseman signed with the New Jersey Devils. A six-year deal worth a total of $25 million. That's an average cap hit of 4.166 per year. He was a second-round draft pick, 60th overall in the 2012 draft. And, uh, again, this is a situation where this is his first big boy contract. That's what I like to call it. (laughs) Get out of that entry-level deal, you get your first big boy contract. Well, this is it for him. Uh, Obviously, New Jersey wants to stick him around for a while, signing him six years. I think a lot of teams are signing these longer contracts, too. I think long term that helps them with the cap value because then they can get away with signing a guy for a lower amount of money per year by giving them yeah. that that extra you know that length uh, length of term uh, right and I think that that helps the team in the long run because they can keep the you know the salary cap down right which gives them a chance to compete because if you get too many guys making too much money you get you know you turn into um, the Chicago Blackhawks and you get. S- in a situation yeah. where you got to get rid of a bunch of guys, Bruins yeah. did that after 2013. They were, they gotten salary cap hell and had to get rid of a bunch of guys. So yeah, um, so we've seen teams do it in the past, and I think these longer term deals is, are a way for uh, teams to try to get around or try to control as much of that as possible. But yeah. anyway, back to uh, Severson. He had uh, 31 points in 80 games last year. 
Uh, three goals, twenty-eight assists. Not bad for a for a defenseman. Stay at home. Um, I I would say somewhere in between. I, yeah. Stay at home guys would probably be in the you know fifteen to twenty point area. He got thirty-one. Yeah. Uh, twenty-one the year before, and seventeen the year before that. So yeah. again, this guy's numbers are going up. If he if he can crack you know the forty point, I wouldn't exactly call him stay at home. But right. um, definitely a top six pairing guy. It sounds like. Oh, for sure, he'll be on the team. And, yep. And I I think um I think Wayne, you know, I I have a special place inside for defensemen. I, I think it's the <laughs> toughest position in hockey. It is. And. and you know, when you have a guy that's playing the way you want him to play and there's attributes about his game that you want to keep, uh, signing a defenseman and locking him up long term is is the way to go rather than a two year deal or a one year deal or yep. or something like that. So New Jersey, again, they must see something in him that uh, that makes him uh, uh, very valuable to them. Yep. Yeah. And having continuity, especially with your defenseman. And goaltenders is definitely a key to uh, having a good team for sure. All right. And the last two signings that have happened since we last recorded, just a couple of uh, probably low level two way deals. Um, my, my list doesn't tell me whether or not it's a two way deal. I'm just guessing. But Brandon Mashinter and Petteri Lindbaum uh, both signed contracts worth uh, one year at a total of 650000 uh, Lindbaum signed with the Blues and Mashinter signed with the Sharks, uh, both signed on September 11th. And that's all the contracts that have actually happened uh, since we last recorded. They haven't had any yesterday or today, at least today, none announced as of yet. Um, that's right. So let's take a quick look real quick at who is left out there. Uh, first, let's start with the restricted free agents. Uh, first and foremost, at the top of the list, David Pasternak. Um, yeah. We've talked about him almost every week since then. Uh, 21-year-old, uh, Bruins forward, 70 points last year in 75 games, and uh, he is still waiting for his contract. And Bruins fans, i got to tell you, are in a big panic over this because there's recent rumors that have come out that have said uh, that, or his apparently his agent is flapping his gums saying that, uh, uh, Pasternak could sign the KHL if the Bruins don't do what they need to do and, and sign him to a deal. And I've heard all sorts of rumors as to what Pasternak is 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 asking for. Everything from seven and a half on up to, um, what, 11 a year or something like that. I even right. heard, yeah, one report where, where, the, where the initial uh, ask from the Pasternak camp was for like 11 and a half a year, which is like a million over what the Bruins have in cap space. Well, I don't know why they would ask for more than what the Bruins have in cap space for a guy like him. And, you know, 11 plus million for Pasternak um, would be robbery, in, in in my opinion. Yeah. Pasternak's not an $11 million player. Yeah. But, um, you know, everybody keeps pointing at that dry sidle deal as, as something. And, you know, it, it's that dry sidle deal obviously um, is is going to increase the price for Pasternak for Boston. So, yeah. I don't know. Let's just hope that something gets done here soon. Um Hey, the, the last headline I read said the GM is talking with Boston. Uh, and the, the excuse me, the agent for uh, uh, Pasternak is talking with the GM. Uh, I guess that's uh, uh, Sweeney. Yeah. Uh, every single day they're talking. Yeah, they're about talking it. almost daily at this point. So, yeah, yeah. I expect so, something will get done. Um, I would, you know, probably in the next week or so. Hopefully by the time we record next week. And I think we said this last week. That, I think that we Pasternak, did. <laughs> Pasternak yeah. will be signed. So, I, I think you're right. But I think it's a matter of time now. At least they're talking. They weren't even talking last week. Yeah. Both sides were waiting for the other to start the conversation last week. <laughs> now they're at least talking every day. So yeah. I fully expect something to get done here. I don't I don't think Pasternak's going anywhere. You know, if things if things weren't going well, then it would be just like you said last week. No negotiations. There wouldn't be anything to talk about and they wouldn't even say anything. Yeah, uh, but it's not. It, they're talking every single day. So obviously, I, I'm sure you know he he likes uh, being with the Bruins, or th this wouldn't be going forward. You know, so yep. I I think I think that something's going to happen. Yep, I agree. Yep. So, all right, the next person on the list, as far as restricted free agents, still out there, Andreas Athanasu, uh, 23 year old center, restricted free agent for the Red Wings, 29 points in 64 games last year. Um, I don't know the details of his situation, but I do know uh, he is out there as as an 
as of yet unsigned. And I think I did see an article where he too has threatened to go over to Europe to play if they don't sign him soon. Yeah. Um, so obviously Detroit will be looking to get him signed fairly quickly. And and this is a player, yeah, he scored 18 goals last year, um, but only 29 points. Right. Um, <clears throat> I just don't know um, what kind of money Athanasu is asking, but if it's anything anything over three, four million, I think is too much, but for a guy like him, right. but I guess we'll find out on that one. Josh Anderson with the Columbus Blue Jackets has yet to be unsigned 29 points in 78 games last year. Similar player to Athanasu where uh, he had more goals than assists. He had 17 goals last year uh, and 12 assists. So, um, again, Columbus will be wanting to lock him up pretty soon. Uh, Minnesota has Marcus Felino as a restricted free agent. 26-year-old left winger, 80, 80 games last year, 23 points. Um, this one, he's still technically a restricted free agent, but difference between his and the others is uh, he his last contract was not a uh, entry-level deal. He was paid. He was last paid two point two five million. Oh yeah. So whether or not they want to continue paying um, for twenty three points, two point two five, I I think that's right around the right ballpark for that amount of production. Mm -hmm. I don't know about you, but <laughs> sounds good to me. I yeah. Mean, you know. Um... So I don't know if he's asking for a significant pay raise or not. Sometimes it's it, it, correct me if I'm wrong. Sometimes I would think it's it's uh, it, it might be bonus structure, you know, or uh, maybe maybe it's an incidental that we don't think about. Yeah, but it's important to the player. You know, uh, if if I if I do so well, if I do this, I, I expect you know a bonus of this, and you know ways to to you know if you scratch my back, if I scratch, if I do what you want, you know, you give me what I want, you know, that yep. type thing maybe. Um, uh, yeah, and and the point total that he got last year is pretty standard for his uh, last several years. I mean, if you look at his last four years in Buffalo, he had 19 mm -hmm. points, 20 points, 23, and 23. So 20 to 25 points is about what you're going to get from him at this point in his career. Right. So um, obviously uh, Minnesota doesn't want to pay too much for that. And then the right. last restricted free agent I have is Nikita Zadorov uh, with the Avalanche. He's a 22-year-old defenseman. He had uh, 56 games played last year, 10 points, all assists. But, of course, you know, granted he was on the avalanche, but he was a minus 20 in the plus-minus category. Wow. But again, you know, avalanche. <laughs> they were a bad team last year. So. <laughs> they had a lot of players in the minus category, I'm sure. <laughs> all right. So as far as restricted free agents, that's all I have record of. Uh, yeah. Let's take a look at unrestricted. Uh, yeah. I'm not going to go into too much detail on these, but just list a bunch of names that are still out there. Of course, Yarmir Yager is still looking to play. He's the, he still says he wants to play in the NHL this year, uh, so he's out there. Um, he's 45 years old, had 46 points last year. I mean, it's got to be a team out there that's going to find some value in his um, right. being around. I mean, just yeah. the fact that they know for sure that at least a few games a year they're going to sell – up to 10 to 12 tickets just to bring the traveling Yagers in. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, that's got to be worth something right there, right? <laughs> Those lucrative traveling Yagers bringing in their cash. I mean, Yagers should sign in Calgary. That's where those guys are from. So <laughs> then he'd, he'd be forcing the traveling Yagers to uh, get season tickets. <laughs> <laughs> So uh, Brian Gianta is also out there. P.A. Parento, Jerome McGinley, Mike Ribeiro, Daniel Winnick, Alex Chason, Yari Korpikowski, Cody Franson, Scotty Upshaw, Brendan Peary, uh, Dennis Weidman, Ryan White, Chris Vandeveld, Feder Tutin, Chris Kelly, Yuri Hoodler, Roman Polak, Joseph Carmosa, Jay McClement. Um, those are just some of the names that are that are out there as unrestricted free agent. I mean, the list goes on and on and on, um, but those are just some of the bigger names, uh, at least in terms of production from last year, uh, that uh, that are still out without a contract. Most of those guys, if you look at that list, they're all 30, 35 and up type players. That's right. Older players. So I think it's if, if Yager does play this year in the NHL, I'm going to go out on a limb. Either Florida's going to sign him back, and I don't know if there'll be a reduced contract there, or he's going to go to Calgary. I think Florida has said that they're not. They're definitely they're not, not going to take him back. To take him back, yeah. yeah. Well, that's a shame. 
So yeah. they're looking to move ahead, I guess. Yeah. All right. Let's take a look at, before we head on to news stories, let's take a look at the other category of signings, the player tryout. Um, I've got an article that has all of the tryout contracts, and I may be reiterating something that we might have done last week, but I'm going to go down through uh, some of these players real quick and just list some of the players that where they're going to be playing at least their preseason. Now, of course, a pro tryout contract, if you're not aware, is basically it's it's what it is is what it sounds like. It's a tryout contract, so neither side is obligated in any way to continuing after a certain point. Uh, basically, all it means is these players are going to be uh, playing with these particular teams during the preseason. Oftentimes, the players end up not signing with that team and then, based on how they do in preseason games, end up signing with another team. You see that quite a bit. Mm -hmm. uh, but here's where some of the players are going now. Arizona's got Tyson Strawn, defenseman. Buffalo's going to have Col Cody Golubev, defenseman. Uh, Calgary's going to have Tanner Glass. Joseph Carmosa, Dylan Olson, all <laughs> in their camp. Chicago's got Cody Franson, Drew Miller, John Mitchell, Mark Stewart, all coming into yeah. their camp. Colorado's well, got you know, yeah. Some of these guys, some of these guys are guys like you you said that are that are on the unrestricted free agent uh, list. Yep. And they're uh, still so you, you, right, and because they've signed a pro pro tryout contract. They're still considered unrestricted free agent. Anybody can sign them at any time. But right. these guys will be playing with these these respective teams at least for the preseason until they sign or don't sign. Some of them may, you know, get through the preseason and and just announce their retirement if they can't get a job. Right. So you, you you'll see that too. Colorado's got Jared Cowan coming in. Uh, Columbus has Brad Thiessen, Brady Austin, Joe Pendenza, um, Miles Cooley's Brent. Uh, Brett Gallant, uh, some of those names I haven't heard of. Uh, Dallas has R.J. Umberger. Detroit has David Booth and P.A. Parento. Edmonton has Chris Kelly. Florida has uh, Nikolai Beloff, Brandon Peary, uh, Harry Zol Zolnerchik. That was a toughie. Uh, and L.A. has Chris Lee, Andre Lotkinoff, Luck Brandon Prust, Brooks Like, Shane Harper, T.J. Hensick, Sam Hur, Shane Walsh, Brett Sutter, uh, Jamie Devane, and Philip Maillet. Uh, Brooks Like, interesting note on that. Isn't he married to um, one of the Dancing with the Stars girls? Uh, what's her name? Julianne Huff. Oh, I think you he's know, married. I, I think he's. I'm one. pretty sure he's married to Julianne Huff. Uh, so, which makes sense him trying out for the L.A. Kings since she's <laughs> she's pretty much her career keeps her out in L.A. quite a bit. So. Oh, I see. Okay. So that that makes a lot of sense there. Um, I hope Brandon. Russ finds a home, you know, because he's a good player. Uh, he would, he would, he would be a fan. Uh, fans would like him. Yeah, not many, not many Bruins fans would like him. Maybe if he was wearing a Bruins <laughs> uniform. Just going yeah. back to his time with Montreal, is he's, he's <laughs> yeah, he's pretty much. He was, he was, a, he was a fan favorite with the Rangers. Yeah, yeah, I'm sure, and he was with Montreal, but he certainly wasn't with Boston when he was Go wearing ahead. a Montreal jersey. Uh, Minnesota Wild has Ryan Malone, Daniel Winnick. Uh, Montreal has Eric Jelena. New Jersey has Jimmy Hayes and Tim Erickson. Yeah, that's interesting, too. Uh, did Boston boot Jimmy Hayes? Yep, they bought him out. Yep. Oh, that's right. That's right. I forgot about that. Yep. Okay. So he's free to sign anywhere else. And we, I guess with his brother playing for the Rangers, would you know, yep. why not have Jimmy go to the same city? If he right. can, if he can latch on with the Devils, yep. and he has a pretty good chance because the Devils aren't a very good team, but he's got a Jimmy Hayes can be a good, decent player, but he just doesn't, he just doesn't bring it every night. At least he didn't in Boston. So I'm looking for a big year out of his brother Kevin. Yeah, I, I know we don't want to digress, but I, I think Kevin Hayes is going to have a big year for the Rangers this year. Yeah, yeah, he he has a, definitely every opportunity to have a big year. All right, going back to the Islanders, Casey Bailey and Ben Holmstrom. Uh, the Rangers brought in Bobby Farnham and Andrew Desjardins. Uh, Ottawa brought in Chris Vandeveld, Brendan Woods, Kyle Flanagan, Charles David Bowden. Pittsburgh brought in Jay McClement. Uh, St. Louis has Mike McKee, Ty Loney. Vancouver has Ryan White, Scotty Upshaw. Washington has Yuri Yokopaka and Alex Chason. Winnipeg has Brody Sutter, Peter Stoyakovich, uh, Francis Bayou, Boyou Veillier. <laughs> <laughs> That's a very French name. <laughs> Beauvillier. Beauvillier, yep. And Patrice Cormier. Cormier, and, yeah. And Vegas has... <laughs> yeah. And Vegas has yeah. Uh, Bryce Gervais, Nikolai Bouillard, Scooter Vaughn, 
Kenny Morrison, and Stephen McCauley. Uh, and if I didn't mention your favorite team, that's because your favorite team did not sign or have any pro tryouts as of yet. And we'll update that list again next week as we uh, head into the preseason. Um, and I noticed the Bruins haven't signed anybody yet, so interesting. Well, they got a lot of young talent come up, so I'm I'm not surprised. Yes. All right, let's go on to some of the news stories that have happened over the past week. Uh, the first one came out yesterday. The Calgary Flames will no longer pursue a new arena in the city, President Ken King said on Tuesday. That was yesterday, obviously. Uh, the owners group are pretty clear, pretty definite in their view on that, King told the Flames website. Building's very important. We've been working on it for a long time, but it doesn't look like we're going to get there. And I think it's time we stop pretending and we're a little honest with our fans and our city on that fact. Talk stalled when Calgary Mayor Nahid Nancy, uh, Nenshi, sorry, balked at the spending taxpayer money on a new building, Sportsnet said. We'll just go on and run our business and do what we can to figure out what the future will look like later, King said. He said the Flames are not actively seeking a new home. We're not talking about relocation. We're talking about upcoming training camp, King said. We're not shopping. Scotiabank Saddledome has been the Flames' home since it opened in 1983 and is the oldest arena that has not been renovated in use in the NHL. NHL Gary, uh, Commissioner Gary Bettman has said in the past that the Flames do need a new arena. I think everybody knows the new arena is important on a whole host of levels for a whole host of reasons, he said on March 15th in Calgary. You've got to get from here to there, and since I tend to be an optimist by nature, I'm hoping that on both sides, not that there are sides, but the city and the flames can figure this out. It's important. It's vitally important that it gets done. We'll just operate as long as we can and work as hard as we can, King said. We've made it work for 36 years. I guess we're going to have to make it work a little while longer. A lot of negativity coming out of those comments. I don't know. <laughs> I I did not read a very optimistic, although he tried to say it was. I do not read that as being an optimistic thing no. at all. I, I, it's the first thing. It's what you said is exactly how I felt when I read that. Yeah. Um, they sound a little pissed. And, <laughs> he does. He doesn't like it. And they may not be looking, but, you know, Quebec City, hey, there's your team, you know? Yep. Uh, now, I'm, I'm not I'm not going to – I'm not going to, you know – but you, you, listen, you know that – We've talked about it on a previous podcast. It's 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 uh, it's common news around the NHL. That arena, the Saddle Dome, took a huge hit two or three years ago with the floods in Calgary. Yep. Um, and I don't care what they say. You know, they still have quirks and quirks, things to, to to straighten out. There's probably problems with mold or some sort of lasting uh, communications things that break down whatever because uh you know it was it was a terrible damage done to that arena so that being in the back of ken king's mind and brian burke's mind it's just not going to go away that's not going to go away right so they're going to work they're going to work on it and yeah they may put to uh, put things to, to rest for a year maybe but you know the longer this goes on and they don't get a new arena um i i just think the, the better the chance is that one day they will move. Um, yep. uh, that's what I think. Yep, uh, I agree 100%. Yep. Uh, I hate to see the Calgary Flames go because they've been there since, geez, I was a kid, you know, when they moved. Um, yep. I, I barely remember it when they moved from Atlanta to, to Calgary. So, yeah, to ha to see the Flames go would be a, would be a terrible thing because I think that city can, I mean, support it. I mean, the, the, they, they practically sell out the place every game, so... Fan interest obviously is not an issue, it, you know, like it is in, in any Canadian city. For you know, they're they're so crazy right. about hockey there. So so getting the fans in the seats is not the problem here in Calgary. The problem is um, you've got an owner that wants taxpayer money to pay for this new arena, and um, the city is saying, mm, "No, we can't afford it. Sorry." Yeah. And, so uh, you know what what will happen? We don't know. Um, maybe maybe the uh, the Flames owner decides to sell the team, and then the right. new then the new owner bankrolls a new arena. Who knows what what the future is there? But right now it looks like everybody's kind of ticked off, and they're going to say, "All right, forget it. Let's just let's just go play hockey for this year, and then we'll revisit this 
but it's not going away. Like you said, no, the, no, it's, is- it's not going away. It's not going to be something where, oh, well, you know, we'll put five, 10 years down the road. We'll put, that's not, it's in the, it's in their minds. What the damage that that arena had is in their minds along with probably as, as the manager said, as the president, uh, Ken King said, a host of other things. Yep. So, uh, you know, it, it's, uh, it's something that they will address. And I don't think Wayne, uh, we're looking at it to be a long-term thing for them to address. I, I think it's something that they'll probably address, uh, very, very soon, two, three years, uh, with no, uh, with no, uh, concessions or no, no decisions being made by, uh, the management, uh, uh, with the city of Calgary. Yep. I, I just think that's what they're going to do. They'll start looking for it. And it's a money thing too, you know? Yep. Um, if they can get into a new arena like the one that this built is sitting there empty in Quebec City, why and why not do it? You know, I, and I'm not listen, I'm not I'm not saying that's what they should do. I'm just saying this is a business thing and uh, it takes on a, a mind of its own very soon. Yeah. And if you know, if the, if Calgary, if, if the city of Calgary refuses to put up arena now, look, I'm of the camp where these owners are billionaires, right? Yeah. My personal opinion is these billionaires should be bankrolling their own arenas anyway. Right. And right. especially, you know, if 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 I were, a, you know, a billionaire, billionaire, own the hockey team, I would want to build the arena. That way I control the concessions. I control the parking. I control all the uh, all the revenue streams that come with having an arena. You know, right. other other events that take place in that arena, you know, I would get a cut as an owner. Right. You know, I would be all for, you know taking care of the cost of a new arena myself because I would have financial interest in uh, everything that goes on in and around that area. You know, the restaurants right. that, that end up inside the arena, you know, that are paying rent and, you know, all of that stuff, all of those revenue streams are all part of the package. Right. Now, some of these owners, they don't, they don't want the, uh, the real estate side of that business. They just want right. the city to build an arena. And then, you know, they pay rent towards that it you know it varies from owner to owner the setup but um that's right you know one way or another the calgary frames are either going to get a new arena or they're going to get out of town i that's the only the only two solutions i see in this in this situation now obviously they've put it off they've kicked the can down the road so to speak a little bit uh but it's gonna they're gonna catch up to it and they're gonna have to um do something about it at some point because yeah the days are numbered for that arena just for the whole I like the whole host of reasons they said. And one of those yeah. reasons is that nice, shiny new arena sitting right up the road in, in Edmonton. So. Edmonton. Oh, you know. <laughs> and, and that's so true. And, and and another thing he says is, you know, it's the oldest arena in the NHL that hasn't been refurbished or whatever his wording was. You know, it's ne- yeah. never been. Re- I mean, he had to throw that in. Oh, it's the oldest arena that's never been renovated. You know, uh, getting a dig in, you know, on the mayor, on the mayor, uh, uh, you, you haven't even renovated the place. So I, I, I think um, I think we talked we talked about it. Remember Brian Burke, Brian Burke saying uh, we, we won't we won't talk about it. We'll just leave. Yeah. You know, so uh, I, I get the feeling that uh, that the negotiations have not gone well for a long time, for, yep. you know, and when I say a long time, a year, maybe two years, I, you know, it's, they've been talking about it for a while. And it's like you say, they're kicking the can down the road, and they're going to run out of road. Yep. So, uh, you know. Well, we'll see how that comes out. We'll be keeping an eye on it for sure. All right. Let's turn our attention to the NHL Network uh, preseason schedule. They announced it yesterday, uh, what they're basically, the what games they're going to be televising. They're going to have more than 20 preseason games, which will include the Vegas Golden Knights' first game against the Vancouver Canucks at Rogers Arena on Sunday. Uh, They'll air four uh, Golden Knights preseason games. Talk about your shiny new object syndrome. Uh, (laughs) (laughs) three Three against Pacific Division opponents, the Canucks, the Kings, on September 26th, and the Sharks on October 1st. In addition, the network will air Detroit Red Wings' first game at Little Caesars Arena. I want to see that. I saw the video where they showed um, the uh, the open house. What a spectacular-looking arena that is. Oh, I'm telling you, it looked beautiful. I, I saw uh, pictures of, uh, I forget who it was, talking about the new arena. Yep. Uh, and they, they did some video shots around inside. It does look spectacular, absolutely so. spectacular. So, yeah, I'm looking forward to watching that game just to see the new arena. And, of course, they're going to be showing it off in between whistles, I'm sure. 
And then uh, a quote out of this story. I think everybody knows the new arena is important on a whole host of levels for a whole host of... Oh, wait, I'm, I'm in the wrong story. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> wow. <laughs> Woo. Anyway, um, so yeah, Red Wings first game at Little Caesar Arena against, the, of course, the Boston Bruins on September 23rd. That's a 7 p.m. game. Uh, I definitely will be watching that. I'm going to be off that day. My son's got his referee clinic that day. So uh, the defending Stanley Cup champion Pittsburgh Penguins will face their 2017 Eastern Conference first round opponent, the Columbus Blue Jackets, in each team's final preseason game at PPG Paints Arena on September 30th. The NHL net, uh, Network will also air the second game of the 2017 NHL China games between the Kings and Canucks at Wukasong Arena in Beijing on September 23rd. But that game's going to be televised at 3.30 a.m. Eastern Time, which will be, well, it's a midnight start, 12.30 uh, West Coast. So you West Coast people that stay up late will be able to watch that one. I don't know if I'm going to get up at 3.30 in the morning to watch a game. but Uh, And the 2017 Craft Hockeyville Canada game between the Devils and the Senators in O'Leary PEI on September 23rd. Uh, that game will also be on NHL Network. I didn't say anything about the Kraft Hockeyville game in the U.S. No, they haven't. But they are supposed to play that, aren't they? Bef- That's before. usually on NHL Network, too. Yeah. That game is in, I think it's another Pennsylvania city this year. I can't yeah, remember I believe what, it's right. I can't remember, yeah, what, I remember. what won, but I, I remember seeing when they announced who the winner was for the U.S. game. I'm like, really? Another Pennsylvania te- city? Yeah. You can't was put it, it Johnstown? Some- I don't know. That was last year. Johnstown oh, okay. was last yeah. year. Um, this year, I think it's in the uh, Johnstown's out near Pittsburgh, and this year it's uh, I don't have it in front of me, but it, I know it's another Pennsylvania city. I think it's up near uh, on the on the eastern side of the state this time. Mm-hmm. So, so be interesting to see on that one. But of course, you know some of the local networks too. I think Nesson's going to have a few Bruins games, and MSG will probably have a couple Rangers games. Yeah. So oh no, without a doubt, I haven't checked the schedules of any of those networks. Just just the NHL. But anyway. It's good to see that they're starting to televise. Remember, just it wasn't just a few years ago where you it, you, it almost impossible to find a preseason game televised. Oh, that's true. If, if you wanted we, to see we, preseason hockey, you had to go to the game. That's true. Well, and we used to tune in on the computer and listen to it on the radio. You you didn't have a television game. That's yep. that's very true. Yep, that's that's true. So they're starting yep. to televise them more and more now, which is cool because. Not that I put a lot of stock in the preseason. I don't really care who wins the games in the preseason, but I want to see how individual players are going to do. Right. That's, that's generally how um, how that goes. So, And uh, speaking of games that don't matter, uh, the, the outcome, let's talk about the prospect tournaments. Yes. Um, we've started to see this thing over the last several years where NHL teams are grouping together to play these rookie tournaments. Now, these these have been taking place... Now, as of the last recording that we had, none of these tournaments had taken place. But since we last recorded, almost every team has played and completed a, a rookie tournament or a prospect tournament, whatever you want to call it, mm-hmm. um, somewhere. And uh, every almost every team has uh, had some. It would have been every team uh, had the one in Florida not be canceled due to the hurricane. But um, anyway, let's start. First and foremost, the 2017 Rookie Tournament is what it was called. That was a tournament between Toronto, Ottawa, and Montreal. Basically, they just played a round robin against each other. And Ottawa came out the winner in that one. But again, don't put any stock in the results of these tournaments. Uh, I watched a few games from around all these tournaments. And it's, it's a total... Yeah, they're wearing the NHL jersey. But it's not NHL hockey, I can assure you. Right. The, game, the games, I don't know if you got a chance to see any of it, but the games I, are a I lot have. slower. Uh, and a lot of times the games are taking place in regular arenas that you and I would play in every every you know week to week. Not, right. not even arenas with thousands of seats, just small little <laughs> thousand seat or less arenas where most of these tournaments were taking place. Mm-hmm. Uh, but a lot of them were streamed online. So you were, um, these, none of these were televised, but you could, you could find streams of them. If you, if you looked hard enough <laughs> and you right. really had to look hard, I couldn't oh. even get full results for all of these. I was, I was hard pressed just to find out who the winner of each of these tournaments was. Never mind scores of each game and stats. Right. So, you, you know, Wayne, uh, listen, speaking of, uh, uh it really, and I'm not trying to digress, but one of these tournaments was in Estero, Florida, and they canceled it uh, due to Hurricane Irma. 
Yep. Uh, but I did actually tune in on the Weather Channel. My wife and I were glued to the TV for a while, and we, yeah, we, we certainly were our prayers go out to Florida uh, uh, for the damages and, and and the situations they're facing right now. We certainly hope that uh, things uh, improve and they improve in a timely way for people. Yes. But um, I I I know that there was an arena, and I'm trying to think of the name of it uh, that where they played it. It was actually a shelter for yes. uh, Germain Arena. In the- yep. Germain, that's it, Germain Arena. Yeah. Germain Arena in Estero, Florida. That's where that tournament was supposed to be held. And that's actually a minor league arena. It's not a small arena um, like you would play, you know, youth hockey in. This is right. probably a three to 5,000 seat arena. I'm not sure exactly how many seats they have, but um, the Florida Everblades in the ECHL, that's their home arena. Okay. Okay. Um, and they, yes. they do a lot of stuff down there. There's a college tournament down there that the University of Maine, uh, they didn't the last couple of years, but they used to go to that tournament every year right around Christmas time that that, that arena would host four college teams, NCAA college teams, uh, for a tournament, a holiday-like tournament uh, right. down at that arena. But, uh, yeah, they were supposed to host um, Florida, Nashville, Washington, and Tampa Bay were supposed to go to that arena and play a tournament there, but they ended up canceling the tournament. Right. And then the owners of the arena ended up uh, using it as a uh, shelter for right. for people that were evacuating their homes uh, right. due to the hurricane. Uh, <clears throat> I, I don't know how that, that uh, arena fared, whether there was any damage or any, uh, any problems with things. Um, I don't believe there was any Calgary-like situations. There wasn't any flooding right. uh, for the arena itself. Whether or not you know the, the roof or the outside got damaged due to the winds or not is I, I don't know that. But uh, right. But I think that arena came through pretty uh, pretty well in the storm. Right. Because Estero, Florida, is up near Fort Myers, I think, or something like that, somewhere in that area. And they didn't get hit yeah. as hard as they expected to. That's right. I I watched actually uh, the yesterday a uh, lady uh, on the I think she was on the Weather Channel. She had a guy and a and a cameraman come into her house, and she was in Saint Petersburg, and they had absolutely no damage whatsoever. Yeah. Uh, no water damage to her floors. Nothing. Uh, there was trees down and stuff, but but you know no damage. So I think it was selective where that hurricane. Uh, really ripped things apart, and yeah. in other areas where it it just didn't uh, didn't it, 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 people dodged a bullet, you know. Yeah, yeah. Well, the Florida Keys got hit hard, and uh, um, where it came ashore on the mainland in um, uh, Naples, that city got hit hard. Yeah, Naples. But, but yeah, it, Naples got. It, but but the turn or the uh, the storm weakened significantly after that, and really the only other places that got hit in terms of you know storm damage was really the. The surge on the eastern side of the state, from Miami all the way up through Jacksonville, or even Charleston, South Carolina, um, there was a lot of storm right. surge. Storm surge on the Atlantic coast that ended up uh, causing a lot of damage. So anyway, yeah, we hope that everybody down there can get things back to normal in short order. I know there's a lot of power outage issues. There's actually a guy I used to play hockey with uh, when I was a kid uh, who who's a lineman, and uh, he lives in New Hampshire, I believe. And uh, he's down there with a crew. Um, they drove all. They drove their lime trucks. You know, they brought in trucks from all over the country to help restore power and everything as quickly yeah. as possible down there. So he's he's down there until further notice, until they get things back in in shape. But anyway, yeah. but yeah, the Estero Florida tournament did get canceled due to the hurricane. But the Prospects Challenge in Buffalo went on. That that was Boston, <clears throat> Buffalo, Pittsburgh, and New Jersey. And Pittsburgh ended up being the champion out of that tournament. Uh, the 2017 Young Stars Classic, uh, which took place with Canadian teams, Calgary, Edmonton, Winnipeg, Vancouver. Edmonton was the champion of that one. And of all the tournaments that I watched uh, bits and pieces of, uh, this one played in bigger arenas, uh, junior mostly arenas, you know, uh, with, uh, you know, 5,000, 7,000 seats. And, and there was a lot of people there. I mean, the people are in Canada. They're into their hockey. So, oh, yeah. <laughs> Yeah. So it's there was amazing. there was a lot of people watching those games. Uh the Traverse City Prospects Tournament is the biggest tournament of all of the uh prospect tournaments. That this one has 8 teams and this one's pretty yeah. much the one that started all of this. Yeah. Uh, Detroit, Carolina, Chicago, Colorado, Dallas, Minnesota, Rangers, St. Louis uh all went to Traverse City, Michigan to play in the prospect tournament there. 
and Chicago ended up being the champion in this one. Um, defending champion Carolina uh, ended up taking third this time around. Uh, Columbus was the number two team in that tournament. Uh, the 2017 Prospect Showcase featured Colorado, Anaheim, San Jose, and Arizona. And Anaheim came out uh, on top in that tournament. Mm-hmm. And as far as the rest of the teams, if you ha- if again, if your team hasn't been named, they either didn't play at all or just played a little bit. Like, for example, L.A. and Vegas. Uh, L.A. and Vegas just played uh, two games against each other. And... Uh, actually, they're going to play three games. The third game was supposed to be this afternoon at 4 o'clock Eastern. That game should be over by now. I don't know. I don't have results for it. But uh, L.A. and... and uh, I'm sorry. L.A. and Vegas are only playing two games. L.A. won the first game. Game two was supposed to be today at 4 o'clock. Uh, so, uh, but uh, you know, everybody was talking about how that was Vegas' first ever game on the ice. Oh, of course, yeah. It won't count for anything, but L.A. LA law, uh, beat... Vegas in game one of that one. So, um, also the two of the teams that were supposed to be in Florida ended up going to Nashville and play a couple games against each other. Uh, Tampa Bay and Nashville just played a three game series against each other. And the Predators won that series two games to one. Uh, and the other two teams that were supposed to be in Florida, Washington, Florida, uh, Florida, actually, because of the fact that they were, you know, where they're located, they just got out of town and didn't do anything with the rookies. Uh, and they'll go back in for regular training camp. Washington went back to Washington and just did a bunch of scrimmages amongst themselves. Uh, the Islanders in Philadelphia are the two other teams that we haven't mentioned yet. And those two teams are playing a single game tonight. Uh, as we yeah. speak, that game should have just started. Uh, that was a 7 o'clock start. And that one is being played at uh, the phone booth in Philadelphia yeah. at Comcast Center. Um, so uh, the question I asked with all these is, since this is kind of just a disorganized group of tournaments, you think the NHL should kind of standardize things and and make sure every team plays a some sort of rookie thing? You know, you, you know, Wayne, uh, the first thing that comes to mind for me is that gives the fans, sp- particularly, you know, the, where the Traverse City is Michigan, right? Uh, these tournaments that are in Canada, you know, these fans are, oh, I, you think we go through withdrawal. I can imagine in Traverse City, Michigan, having to go through the whole summer and uh, no hockey. And by standardizing it, my point is, you you give the fans in those areas, as you say, not not large arenas for the most part, uh, something to look forward to. Yep. And uh, so I, I think it would be a good thing from that standpoint. Yep. Um, I think that's a very good question, actually. Yep. Um, now, obviously, if if they were to standardize it, it would end up being a topic in the CBA. So they probably can't do anything there. But um, that uh, that aside. I think to have these showcases and move them around, I, you know, the Traverse City one, you're always going to have that because they've been doing it for years and there's no way that that's going to go away. Right. Um, but but here's the thing. Too. Here's the thing. The reason the reason that I take absolutely no stock in the results of these tournaments and nor should anybody who's a fan of any of these teams is the the players that are there playing for their teams. It is, it is not that team's total prospect pool. There's one major group of players that are missing from these tournaments, and those are your kids that are NCAA eligible. Now, the kids that have dra- that graduated NCAA and their eligibility is used up at the end of last season, and then they're free to come to the and play in these tournaments, and you see a few mm-hmm. of those players. But the kids that are going back to college to finish out their college playing career, they're not eligible to play in these tournaments. If they oh, play I in see. these tournaments... Yeah. They they lose their eligibility. So I see. I see what so you're saying. So it's really only a uh, you know showcase of prospects of players that are coming through the junior system, yeah. the Canadian junior system, okay. and the European systems. Mm-hmm. Those are the only very, players. Very interesting. So point. so you know take no stock in the results of these tournaments. It really means absolutely nothing. It's just a it's just a way to get these rookies to get the owners and the and the coaching staffs of all the respective teams a chance to to see these players in game action mm-hmm. uh, and uh, see them in person give them one more chance or, you know give the players one more chance to impress the coaches right. um, but there's really nothing 
Because a lot of the teams that that are showing up at these things, they're they're the team itself is being filled out at the bottom uh, by camp invitees, is I guess is is the term that they use them, which are guys that probably don't have a snowball's chance in hell of making <laughs> making the American League roster. Never mind the NHL roster. Right. Um, they're just you know extra players that they bring along just to fill out the bottom of the rosters. So mm-hmm. so there's a lot of that. And you know, like for example, the Bruins, both goalies that they brought to this tournament. Um, our uh, our camp invitees and that mm-hmm. really have no shot at, so you know whatever. That's very but, that's very good point, Wayne. So so yeah, there's really nothing riding on any of those tournaments. It's just it's just a way to see the players one more time before the preseason starts, get them a little bit of game action because you're going to see all these players again in the preseason anyway before they get sent back to either American Hockey League or the juniors uh, junior team that they came from. So anyway. Right. Just just some interesting hockey. All right. That's all I have for stories, unless you have anything you wanted to talk about before we get into the uh, team previews. No. Uh, I, I I just uh, I, I think it's commendable what, uh, uh, as you said, uh, Florida and some of these uh, teams that are raising money for Irma victims and uh, and things like that. There's several stories on NHL.com if you there go is. to yeah. check out the website. But uh, the, yeah, the stuff the league is doing, there's stuff that individual teams are doing. Yeah, it's uh, it's it's notable, and and uh, I just wanted to make a real quick point of it. Yep. yep, and you'll find all those stories right on NHL.com. There's not they're not hard to find. So all right, well let's move on to our team by team season previews. This week we picked up from where we left off. Last week we did the. Pacific Division, all the teams. So if you want to, if you're a fan of a Pacific Division team, you want to hear what we thought of your team, uh, catch our show last week, and uh, that was episode season two, episode four, and you'll you'll hear all about those teams. This week, though, we're doing the Central Division, uh, which includes the Blackhawks, the Avalanche, the the Dallas Stars, the Wild, the Predators. The Blues and the Jets. And like we did last week, we will go ahead and do them in alphabetical order. So that means we need to start off with the Chicago Blackhawks. Yes. And this is a team that is in transition. Uh, last season, they, um, or at the end of last season, they were, they're they basically in salary cap hell, I guess is what you want to call it. Um, right. Last year, they had yet another good year. Uh, they were 50-23-9. Uh, with 109 points, um, finished first in their division, third overall in the league. But they had to get rid of a lot of players due to salary cap issues. Players gone, Artemi Panarin, Nicholas Halmerson, Marion Hossa, although Hossa's is due to injury, not so much. Um, uh, they've already announced he'll miss the entire season, so they're calling him gone. Marcus Kruger, Trevor Van Riemsdyk, Johnny Oduya, Scott Gar- Darling, and Brian Campbell. Uh, that is that is some major major talent that has left this team. No question about it, Wayne. Now new new players coming in. You've got Brandon Saad, Patrick Sharp, Lance Boma, Tommy Wingles, uh, Connor Murphy, and Jan Ruda. Uh, oh, goalies Anton Forsberg and Jean Francois Berube. Now with the yep. goalie situation with Scott Darling gone, the backup position is wide open. So right. Forsberg and Berube will be battling for that job. Um, but if you were to just look at the players that I just mentioned alone, the players going out and the players coming in, that tells me right now Chicago is coming back down to earth this year. Uh, I I think uh, I think they will. You, you, there's a lot of pressure on this team too, Wayne, uh, to perform. Um, you know, hey, we still got our core together. We still, you know, and I I think I think that's going to weigh heavy on them. However, uh, I think if they get to the second round, if it's not one round, I mean they were they were literally just destroyed by the Nashville Predators last year. Yep. Um, if if they and you know, they brought yeah. in listen, they brought in some good players, Brandon Sod, uh, sure things, guys they know. Uh, Brandon Sod, Patrick Sharp. Uh, you know they still have Artem Anisimov. Uh, who's who's a, a very valuable player. I'm hearing all kinds of good stuff about Alex DeBrinket. And uh, he was the leading scorer in the OHL last year. They have him. So uh, there's and and you know how Quinville is. He he he's a master at uh, at retooling and tweaking lines, just on the very same level as as uh, Alain Vigneault does the same thing. Uh, he he pulls you and I saw it. He pulled Artemi Panarin out of nothing, and yep. all of a sudden here he here he is. Uh, 
one of the best players in the Central Division. So don't be surprised if this DeBrinket guy, who I'm hearing all kinds of good stuff about, maybe he's uh, he's a, the next Artemi Panarin, the next bread man. Um, I, you know, uh, the goalie yeah. situation is is I, I don't think Chicago's strong in net. Maybe maybe I'm wrong in that way. But uh, I just don't think Cody, uh, Corey Crawford is is on the same level as as say uh, Carey Price or Jonathan Quick or uh, you know the the guys of that uh, Sergey Bobrovsky. Uh, you know you can name four or five guys that uh, I I think are better goalies. Um, yeah, so. um, yeah, he's I wouldn't put him in the top five or so goalies, but he's still good enough. He's definitely going to be their clear number one starter. Um, right. And and you know he he's obviously not going to come back down to earth in, in terms of he basically wasn't going to give Darling a chance to be a starter in, in Chicago. So and that is why right. they, they ultimately moved Darling out is they they felt that Darling could be a starter and uh, obviously Carolina <laughs> agrees. Well, um, yeah. But uh, um, but yeah, Cor- Crawford does have times where. He can be hot and cold, so that can be uh, a concern for the Blackhawks. But, um, but yeah, just just from the players that have come or left the team and the players coming in, yeah, they got some play good players coming in, and they always seem to find a diamond in the rough uh, in yep. terms of prospects. So no doubt we're going to see um, some prospects come out of the woodwork that uh, uh, you know, like a like a Panarin, you know, he came out yep. of nowhere. Uh, you know, that, you know. Don't get me wrong. Chicago's gonna be a playoff team. I think they no, will. Yeah, they're no question. Yeah, um, they're they're gonna be a strong team because the core is still there. They still got Kane. They still got Taves. They still got Duncan Keith. They still got. I mean, a lot of the core players that they had during their three Stanley Cups uh, are still there. Yep. Uh, and they're not going anywhere. So Chicago is still gonna be a tough team to beat, but they're not going to be that runaway first place team that they have been the last several years because yep. because expansion and free agency and cap issues have really cut into the overall top to bottom depth of this team right so that's where uh, where that's where i stand with the the blackhawks now in terms of the, prospects the, the, i said with Chicago. And, and, and I turn it over to you. They are very much a mental team. When you go to play them on the ice, they can control you mentally. They can get under your skin. They get in your mind and in your psyche, and they can beat you. They can break you. They can bring you to your knees. Chicago's had that ability for years now. Yep. And I just see it as uh, – they can still do that. So be, because these guys all won three Stanley Cups for the most part, the core. And, and so – that can happen, and it can also happen in the regular season where they get on a roll and they win. You know, they go 15 games without a loss or points in 15 games. I could see it happening. So I'm I'm not ready to to, uh, to throw the towel in yet on Chicago. I I think, as you said, they're going to be a playoff team, and I'm just I, it, it's going to be interesting. Get get to November, the late Thanksgiving, and see where they are. Yep, yep, for sure. Yeah. All right. In terms of prospects, because we've been doing this for the last for the Pacific Division, we're talking about each team's prospects and what they expect to play. Um, looking at my hockey news here, they they have uh, talking about the, uh, <coughs> the top ten prospects that they have. Um, they have Alex DeBrincat, which you mentioned earlier. Um, they're expecting him to make the team this year, and he'll fit. He'll he'll fill one of those. Um, uh, one of those spots left vacant by their uh, people that have left. Uh, Gustav Forsling, defenseman, is expected to make the team this year. And uh, Anton Forsberg, goaltender, um, obviously with the departure of uh, Scott Darling, that backup <clears throat> role is available, and uh, they're actually expecting Forsberg to make the team this year. So, so they're saying at this point Berube will be in the minor leagues. That's it for prospects that Chicago has that are expected to make the team. Now, who knows? Um, you know, somebody might surprise out of training camp. Someone usually does. So, yep. all right. Well, let's move on to the Colorado Avalanche. Talk about the other end of the spectrum. <laughs> <laughs> Colorado Avalanche last year finished 22, 56, and 4 with a dismal 48 points. Uh, finishing in dead last in the division and dead last in the league last year. 
Um, now you want to say that the only can, there's only one way to go, but up, but right. quite frankly, they could actually go down some more because they finished 30th in the league last year. They could actually finish 31st this year. Yeah. <laughs> Technically. Yeah, that's, it's, it, it could happen. It could happen. Um, um, but, uh, yeah, as far as players coming and going, uh, players that have left Francois Beauchemin, Mikhail Gregorenko, Calvin Pickard, Patrick Weircock, and Rene Bork all have left. Coming in, they've got Colin Wilson, uh, Neil Yakupov, Andre Mironov, and David Warsawski. Uh, else, oh, also uh, Jonathan Bernier in that. Um, I would expect that Bernier is going to challenge Valarmov for the starting job. Um, you know, going back yeah. to. I remember when Jonathan Bernier was playing for the Lewiston Maniacs and he was being projected to be a French or not a franchise goalie, but a definite number one starting goalie uh, in the NHL. And due to, you know, injury issues and other stuff, getting caught behind because yeah. he was in the L.A. King system for a while, getting caught behind Jonathan Quick in the depth chart. Um, he just has never emerged as a clear cut number one. I think mm-hmm. he has a pretty good shot of becoming that here in uh, Colorado. Um, yeah. And the other player, Nail Yakupov, is kind of yeah. an interesting sign. Um, that is. <clears throat> you know, and, and I know he was signed for fairly cheap, too. So, you know, if, if, if Yakupov is going to make an impact in this league at all, obviously uh, this is probably his last shot at doing so. Right. I mean, if you can't make an impact with the – worst team in the league then you're not going to make an impact at all <laughs> right, right i guess right. is where where he stands but uh yeah. you know this is definitely going to be another weak year for colorado as they continue to try to uh rebuild that team um i don't know if they're going to get much better i than they were last year 48 points is pretty low you know the bar is set pretty yeah. low there it doesn't seem to be too hard to beat but um their defense wayne their yeah. defense is just not it's not good and uh, you know, I don't see any anybody they they're bringing in uh, that's gonna really uh, you know pick them up there. No, the um, two the two players on D that they brought in, Marinov and Warsawski, neither one's projected to crack the top six. So that's right. That's right. That's maybe Marinov. They they may win games by outscoring opponents. You know, yep. or uh, Bernier if he takes over the starting role, uh, plays stands on his head. You know and. Uh, but, uh, I, I, the defense has to be fixed here. Look at them on paper with the people like Nathan McKinnon, Matt Duchesne, Gabriel Landis, uh, Nail Yakupov, if he plays, um, they, they have some good offensive threats, Yep. but, uh, it, you know, and confidence, I'm sure too factors into it. Yep. Um, well, and the other, the other major story too, with Colorado is the, the Matt Duchesne situation, which is, is just weird to me. You know, it's, yeah. it's clear they've been shopping him around and there's constant trade rumors with him and nothing uh, is happening. And, and yet he remains, I mean, don't you think it would kind of suck to be a guy like him where, you're showing up at camp yeah. to a team that pray, basically doesn't want you and then right. are trying to get rid of you and, you know, they haven't found a way to do so yet. You know, a lot of people say it's only because the asking price is too high, what Sackick wants in return. But, you know, that story's uh, until that whole situation is resolved, I don't think uh, Colorado is going to be able to move forward on that. I agree. I agree. But, uh, yeah, this is a team that's just a mess, and they needed to blow it up, and they really didn't. Uh, you know, they, they made a few subtle changes here and there, but for the most part, the team that you're getting this year in Denver is going to be the te- same team as, as you had last year, mm-hmm. which doesn't bode well for the, for the, uh, the future of this team, uh, at least in the near future anyway. Right. All right, let's move on to the next team. And the next team I have is Dallas. Yep. Last year, 34, 37, and 11. A very disappointing 79 points uh, after having 109 points the year before. Um, injuries were a major, major issue with Dallas last year. And it's a big part of the reason why uh, they had such a. Um, well, they finished uh, 30 points off of, of the year before in the yes. standings. So. Um, obviously missed the playoffs and, um, you know, it's a team that, uh, we thought was going to be good last year, but just, we did. Did, but just didn't ultimately pan out. 
a lot of it was, you know, they got behind the eight ball with all the injuries and they just kept getting an injury after injury after it. I mean, they, right. they probably missed more man games to injury than any <clears throat> other team in the league by probably a considerable yeah. margin. Yeah. yeah. But as far as players coming and going, <clears throat> uh, they had players leaving were Patrick Sharp, Cody Aiken, Yuri Hoodler, Alex Hemsky, and Antti Niemi. Uh, players coming in were Martin Hansel, Alex Radulov, Brian Flynn, Tyler Pitlick, Mark Mathot. Uh, yeah. Also, Ben Bishop and Mike McKenna were added to the team's goaltenders. Um, I think the moves that Dallas made were pretty good this year. Um, I think I agree. you put Radulov on a line with Sagan and Jamie Ben. It's going to be yeah. a pretty damn good line. Yeah. <laughs> I don't care yeah. what you say. I agree. I agree. I agree with you. Um, I don't know. I... It remains to be seen for me. I could be eating my words when we talk about uh, predicted finish. I'll, I'll tell you, but um, I just this team defensively. They brought in Mark Mathot. That was a good move. Yep. But they they're not. Uh, they they got to they got to they got to prove me. They got to show. They got to bring it. I, you know, uh, Klingsberg, Mathot, Hamhus, Lindell. Uh, you know, you you got about four or five guys. But they got to bring it. If they're going to be the number one team in this division, in the Central Division, they're going to have to be a good defensive team. Yep. Um, and I and I believe that this this division will send five teams to the playoffs. So they they're going to have to really bring it. Right? They're going to have to show defensively that they can they can you know because if Ben Bishop's going to stand on his head every night, eventually that's going to catch up to them. Um. So yeah, and the big if with I, the big if with Bishop is can he stay healthy? <clears throat> right, because he's been rather injury prone <laughs> the last few years. But no, I I really like Dallas for the, for this year. I really think they're going to do uh, pretty well. Um, I wouldn't be surprised if they won the division. Mm-hmm. Um, there, I think that team is just that good. They've they've got the offensive uh, the offensive touch for sure. Um, they got plenty of no offense. Question. Powerful offensive team. Yep. Uh, and Maybe they have been for the last several teams. But, yeah, like you said, can they keep the puck out of their own net? Bringing right. in Bishop will help with that. Bringing mm-hmm. in uh, you know, some of the defensemen. Klingberg is is obviously going to be a year older and a year better. Um, mm-hmm. Bringing in uh, Mark Mathot, he's a good shutdown guy. Yep. Um, that's a good move for them. Uh, I, I think Dallas improved themselves with the moves they made this season or this offseason. Right. All right, let's talk prospects. Uh, as far as the hockey news is concerned, there is one player that they think is going to make the roster this year, and that's Julius Honka, a defenseman. Yep. And mm-hmm. I think Hockey News has him slated as the number six guy. Yes. Yes, they do. Number six guy. So they think he's going to crack the top six this year. They have several other players uh, that are in their system, but that Honka is the only one that they think is going to um, make the team. And then, of course, you got dangling out there CSKA Moscow, Valerie Nashushkin. Uh, oh, has he said he wanted to play for Dallas if he comes over? I, I, oh, that's I right. Him. Dallas owns his rights, yeah. Yeah, they own And his contract runs through this season, so uh, Dallas is actually fully expecting that he'll be back with the team next year. Next year. Yep. yep. So that'll be uh, interesting. All right. Minnesota. Yep. Got to pull them up. Here we go. Last year, they finished 49, 25, and 8 with 106 points. Obviously made the playoffs. Uh, had some good years out of some veterans. Uh, Eric Stahl had a kind of a break. I don't know if you want to call it breakout. A comeback year, I guess, is what you want to call it. He sure it. did. Um, yeah, 28 Eric, goals. Yep, 28 goals last year, 65 points, and he only had, God, it was in the 30s. I don't have it in front of me, but he was only in the 30s the year before that. So um, he had a bit of a comeback year. Um, but uh, Minnesota is a very good team. Um, I think they're going to continue to make the playoffs here for the next couple of seasons. As far as players coming in and going out, players leaving, Martin Hansel. Jason Pominville, Marco Scandella, Eric Halla, er- Alex Took, yep. uh, Darcy Kemper, Jordan Schroeder, and Tyler Gravick uh, all left the team. Players coming in, Marcus Foligno, Eric Raw, Cal O'Reilly, uh, Tyler Ennis, Kyle Quincy, Ryan Murphy, and Alex Grant, and Nicholas Vedberg uh, yep. back in net. Um, I f- think... For the overall most part, I think you got to wash here with the players that are coming and going. Right. So I don't see Minnesota getting either better or worse based on the players that came and went. So 
Um, that yeah. would lead me to believe that Minnesota fans can expect a very similar season to what they had last year. Somewhere in that neighborhood, 100 to 105 points right. is probably a reasonable expectation for them. Hey, listen, Wayne. You know, when I sit here and consider uh, Minnesota— I, I look at them a different light than I do Dallas, and you're gonna when we t- you're gonna probably jump all over me, but I, I just think Minnesota can bring it defensively. Ryan Sutter, Jared Spurgeon, Matt Thumba, Jonas Brodine, they have some good defensemen on that team. They were the seventh best team defensively in the NHL last year. So I I I, I think that's plays I think, in there. I think they're capable of even better than that defensively. Oh oh yeah. They're like I, the opposite I, I, of Dallas, really. Yep, they really are. They're a good defense, a solid defensive team. Yep. And and up through March, they were the one of the best, if not the best team in the West. They had more points than anybody. And I yep. remember they were playing very lights out hockey there for a while. Yep. Devin Dubnik was, was playing awesome. Yep, they were. So if they get going on that tear again with Boudreaux running the pulling the strings, watch out. I think Minnesota could do very very well uh, in the Central. Yep, and uh, I, I they could finish first. It wouldn't surprise me. No, it wouldn't so. surprise me one bit. Um, they're they're definitely going to be one of the contenders, along with uh, Dallas and Chicago and Nashville. I think that those four teams are going to be just duking it out for that top spot. Yeah, for sure. All right, in terms of prospects, uh, Joel Erickson Eck. Yep. Uh, is expected to make the team out of camp this year. Mike Riley, defenseman, they're expecting him to make the team. And uh, Gustav Olofsson mm-hmm. are, is the other player that uh, Minnesota, or the Hockey News anyway, deems worthy of a roster spot this yeah. this season. Everybody else is going to be uh, next season or the season after that. So, right. All right, the next team, Nashville. Nashville. Smashville. They had a great season last year. They finished 41, 29, and 12 with 94 points in the regular season, which isn't really all that spectacular. But in the playoffs, they got white hot, and they ran it all the way to the Stanley Cup final, ended up being two wins away from uh, Stanley Cup yep. championship. Yeah. So Nashville had a and great incredible. year last year. They they did. Um Hey, they were the 16th team to get in the playoffs. I, I, they just, they just got hot in the playoffs, and they walloped Chicago, and that gave them, uh, you know, it was like uh, putting a crown on their head and watching them go because yep. they, they really took off. Yep. So in uh, terms of players uh, coming and going, uh, they really only lost two players: James Neal. He was, of course, went to Vegas in the expansion draft. And Colin Wilson. Uh, players coming in, Scott Hartnell, Nick Bonino, Alexi Yemelin, and Anders Lindback, goaltender. Yeah. Um, I, if there, if it is possible going to the Stanley Cup final, um, I think the Predators actually got better based on the players that they brought in. I agree. I, I, it's safe to say that not much change. What, what they saw last year, they're going to see again this year. Now, of course, they also lost Mike Fisher. He announced his retirement, so... Um, yeah, obviously, right. uh, Nashville or this book was probably printed before he, he announced his retirement because he should be on the no longer with them list. But, um, but you got Hartnell, Bonino, those are two, you know, grit and grind type players. Uh, Lexi Yemelin shores up the defense a little bit. Anders Lindback will be the uh, backup goalie, um, to Pekka Rene. And, uh, right. well, I don't know. Will they play Soros? Yeah. They said the Yoos, Yoos. You say Soros may may win that backup position. That's oh, okay. going to be an interesting. But uh, I I'm not I'm I hey uh, Stranger Things. I I watched Soros play though. He I think he played in the playoffs too. Yeah, um, yeah. He he would he came in in a few mop up roles. Um, you know when Pecorine kind of went cold there in the in the final. Right. He came in for a couple of mop up mop up games where the game was decided and they they yanked uh, Rene out. Okay, in terms of prospects for the Predators, uh, Vladislav Kamenev, a left winger, uh, is expected to make the team this year. And uh, da, 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 that's it. Yeah, they got Dante Fabro, but he's he's at Boston University, and they'll they'll be waiting on him. Yep. Um, also, doesn't uh, doesn't maybe it's not Nashville. Uh, somebody, Jordan Greenway, he might be with Minnesota. 
now that I think about it. Oh, okay. That's a that's a guy mm. that uh, with his size and his skills, he's got great hands. Uh, he might be a force, uh, but I'm, I'm, I think I'm speaking out of turn. I think Minnesota has him coming when he, gra- when he gets out of Boston university. But, uh, anyways. All right. Well, uh, let's move on to St. Louis Boy, we're rolling through these tonight. We're, we're rolling through them. All right. St. Louis finished last season, 46, 29 and seven with 99 overall points. And they made the playoffs last year. Uh, they're actually down from the previous four seasons where they had over 100 points each season. Um, so it is the worst of their last five seasons for St. Louis. And that was be, to be expected. They lost uh, back David Backus the year before, and um, I believe they were suffering some, for some injury issues as well. Uh, as far as players coming and going, the players leaving David Perron, Yori Laterra, Ryan Reeves and Nail Yakupov and players coming in Braden Shen, Bo Bennett, Chris Thornburn, and then they're uh, waiting to sign one or two more. Uh, they have yet to sign. Uh, right. But uh, um, I don't know. I think the team that they got coming in is going to be slightly better. Braden Shen is going to be a nice addition for them. Um, yeah. Very good. I think St. Louis is going to be one of those teams that's going to be right on the bubble between making yeah. the playoffs and not. That one could go either way with them. I agree. Uh, I I actually have them finishing uh, fifth, but but ma- making the playoffs as the fifth team. You got them right on the sense. bubble then. Yep. Yeah. Uh, but I don't see them as I did last year in the same light where I saw St. Louis as, as uh, really one of the best teams. You're looking at a team that's made the playoffs six years in a row now. Yep. But um, I, I, I think they've declined some. Uh, but it'll be interesting to see what Mike Yo does. Um, Jake Allen is now their out and out starter, and he's backed up by Carter Hutton. And we'll see. We'll see what happens and see how it goes um, as far as that being a good goalie tandem. Um, yep. Yeah, know, and we'll see if we'll see if Allen's uh, great year that he had last year it was a fluke or it's something that they can expect every year. Right. That's right. All right. In terms of uh, prospects. Ivan Barbashev yep. and um, Oscar Sundquist. Yep. George Schmaltz. Jordan Schmaltz, the defenseman. Are all supposed to make the team this year. Yeah. Now, you you know, uh, looking at these guys too, uh, Barbashev, Schmaltz, uh, Vince Dunn, they're, they're all out of the Chicago Wolves in the AHL. Yeah. But that team is now the, uh, the uh, affiliate for the Las Vegas uh, Golden Knights. Oh yeah, so yeah, yeah. Yep. I don't. I don't know what St. Louis is going to do. Uh, I guess they're waiting on a, on another team. Yeah, there's only 30 American League teams and there's 31 NHL teams, so um, two teams are going to have to share. Oh, I see. Okay, okay. Until okay. the 31st NHL or AHL team comes along. But okay. yeah, ultimately, I see St. Louis as a team that's going to be you know bouncing on either side of the playoff line. Right. I hear you. And if five teams do go from that division, St. Louis will be one of them. I, I think so, unless the next team we talk about, I don't know. I'll, I'll wait till we get going. <laughs> All right, Winnipeg is the next team that we need to talk about. Yep. All right, last year they finished 40, 35, and 7, a total of 87 points, missed the playoffs. Um, and this is a team, they're playing in one of the smallest arenas in the NHL. Right. Attendance-wise, but they're selling out every game, so mm-hmm. <laughs> go figure. Um, and those fans love them. They do. Yep, they certainly do. Um, but uh, uh, it's a team that has been struggling over the past several years of of getting to the next level. When they first moved from Atlanta to to Winnipeg, I mean, these guys were horrible. The Jets were horrible. Yeah, one of the worst teams in the league. Yep. Uh, since then, they the, you, you're seeing the slow step up. You know, getting better, 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 and better. They peaked yep. a couple of years ago. Was it last year or the year before where they actually made the playoffs? Yeah, it's two years ago. Yeah. Um, last year, they took a bit of a step back from that. So. Yep. Now, I'm not sure that that was all entirely their fault because they were in that that horrible division with all those talented other teams. Right. And they just didn't have that enough talent to compete. Um, but I think this year you're going to continue to see, uh, you know, the baby, the baby steps that they're taking. Oh, yeah. Yeah. So. I, the, here's the thing. I, I see this team. You remember last year, Wayne, we talked about uh, 
uh, Columbus and how they uh, they look good on paper. Yeah, confidence was what was needed. And we both said, you know, Columbus could really do it, and they did. I see Winnipeg as the Columbus of of the of the Western Conference conference. Makes sense. Uh, you know, um, they got a great defense. Uh, they really do. They they've got four or five guys right off the top that that could play on any team as as starting defensemen. But if you look at them uh, and their offense, the 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 initial season of Line A was tremendous. Mark Shifley had a great year. Nikolai Ellers, another great player. Uh, if you look, Brian Little, Blake Wheeler, go down their line. They got some great players on that team. Kyle yep. Garner. I'm, I'm, I'm telling you, the, if they get off and get going good, this team could, could finish and win and make it to the playoffs. I really believe it. The Jets have the the capability, but confidence is what what they need. Yep. And as much as we say St. Louis is probably on the positive side of that bubble line, I think Winnipeg's going to be nipping at their heels all season. I think Winnipeg's oh, yeah. going to be just below the playoff line and and occasionally will bounce up into the playoffs and bounce somebody out. But I think at the end of the season, ultimately, um, Winnipeg will still be on the outside looking in. But, uh, you know. It, vastly improved, though. They should be improved over <laughs> last year. Now, as far as players that are coming and going, I don't think we've talked about them yet. Andre Pavlik, Paul Posma, and Otis Thornburn are all out. And in, we have Michael uh, Scargo- Scarbosa. I'm getting that name wrong. Uh, Dmitry Kulikov and yep. uh, Steve Mason. So I don't He's know what your, your opinion is on whether Mason's going to be better than Pavlik. I would uh, like to well, say yes. but Yeah, uh, I, I think Connor Hellebuck... Uh, he did well last year, and then he fizzled, and then he did well. So, I, Steve Mason's there. I think he's going to make uh, Connor Hellebuck earn it. Yeah, and uh, I, I, I think uh, it. Hey, that that that's not as bad a goaltending situation as 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 others um, in this division, in my opinion. But um, we'll, we'll see. Steve Mason is a good goalie. I, I watched him in Philadelphia. I watched him in Columbus. And he can win games for you. He just him, he himself. So uh, it, well, it remains to be seen how they do there in the goaling goaltending situation. But yeah, yeah, for sure, because you just never know. All right, let's take a look at prospects for the uh, the Jets. And let's see, Tyler. I'm oh, sorry, Kyle Connor uh, is expected to make the team this year, and I'm actually excited about him. He's from what I've heard, he's a fun player to watch. Yeah, uh, and uh, he's actually the only one out of the Jets. Um, so, Medical yeah. Moves. yeah, yeah. Of course, he led the nation in scoring what two years ago, right? Yeah, uh, with Michigan. Yep. So I don't have his draft situation. I was, I was trying to find it there. Um, yeah, Kyle Connor drafted 17th overall in the 15 draft. So. Right. Scored 44 points in 52 games with Manitoba last year in the American Hockey League. So, uh, I think he's he's ready to go. <laughs> we'll put it that way. If anyone, yeah. <laughs> if there's going to be a year that he's going to make uh, the NHL team, I think this is it. So should be yeah. interesting to see. All right. Well, um, do you have anything else you want to add to these? I just, I just give you my projected finish. I don't know if you're going to agree with it, Wayne. All right. This week, I think there's, I, I here's how I got it. Number one, the Nashville Predators, and then number two, Chicago, and that's probably, but I pick Chicago. Three, Minnesota. Four, Dallas. Five St. Louis, six Winnipeg, and seven Colorado. That's how I have it. Uh, right. I could see Winnipeg uh, surprising. I could see Dallas jumping up there and uh, flipping with Chicago to second place. It's going to be interesting. All right, but that's here's, how I pick. Here's it. how I'm going to nail it in. I'm going to commit here. Um, I don't have it written down or anything. I'm just going to do it off the top of my head, just on gut feel. Um, but yeah. I think uh, I'm going to go out on a limb and say. Dallas is going to take the division. Yeah. And that's a big if whether or not Bishop stays healthy. Right. Um, followed by Nashville, then Chicago. Yep. Then Minnesota, then St. Louis. And they yep. will all make the playoffs. Uh, and that leaves uh, Winnipeg and then Colorado as the two teams on the outside looking in. I can see it going that way, Wayne. Yep. That's a good one. Remains to be seen. It's, a, it's going to be interesting <laughs> to watch. <laughs> yep. Yeah. All right, so let's now head into the part of the show that we call the Minor League Hockey Minute. 
And actually, we've been saying all along the KHL is the only league playing right now. And if you were to look at HockeyDB's morning report, or that's what it's called, at HockeyDB.com slash scoreboard, uh, that basically is a one-page roundup of all the past 24 hours action around the hockey world. And you will see several leagues have now begun playing games so far this season. Wow. Um, you're starting to see signings at the lower level uh, uh, pro leagues. I'm seeing a list of just today alone. I've seen a list of ECHL, Su- uh, Southern Pro Hockey League, American Hockey League signings. So you've seen a whole bunch of these signings uh, going on already. Oh, and look, uh, Minnesota today announced the retirement of center Ryan Carter. Um, just looking at the morning report for today. Uh, Nashville announced the retirement of forward Vernon Fiddler and the, uh, uh, the Pittsburgh Penguins, Alex Diorio, uh, was signed for Pittsburgh to an entry level contract. Uh, well, yesterday, uh, you see some AHL signings, ECHL Buffalo has already s- sent down several players. Buffalo has signed Arvin Atwal, Colin Blackwell, Justin Danforth, Anthony Florentino, Alex Kyle, and Daniel Muzito, uh, Begenda to Rochester the American Hockey League, and they released Jake McGrath, Carl Neal, and Clint Windsor. Winnipeg released Tyler Bolin, Richard Hoog, Cody McDonald, Christian Reichel, Matthew Sevigny, Antoine Crate, Bill Zeal, and Cole Keller from their ATOs. So those are all ATOs that they got rid of. Wow. So a lot of transactions anyway. But getting back to the minor league hockey minute, there's several leagues that have already started up. Uh, the Ontario Junior Hockey League, and that's not the OHL. This is a lower tier junior hockey league. They've started up Central Canadian Hockey League, uh, British Columbia Hockey League. These are all lower level junior leagues that have started up. Mm. Uh, the Austrian League is now two games into their season. British Elite Hockey League's started. The Deutsch Hockey League, which is in Germany. Uh, the Eastern Hockey League, which is, a again, a lower-level junior league here in the U.S. Uh, the Czech League, the Swiss League, and the Alps Hockey League have all started games. Oh, the Finnish League, is all is, they're all underway. Wow. So they've all played between one and three games, all those other leagues. But the KHL has played uh, as many as 10 games already. Yeah. And I didn't look at the standings for the KHL, but as of or according to this uh, this morning report, they're showing St. Petersburg with a 10-0-0 record. I believe that's correct. Yeah. And CSKA has got a 9-1 record. Yep. So definitely predictable. But your <laughs> your minor league hockey minute does have something to do with the KHL, so I'll let you go. Okay. I'll, I will go. Re- and and uh, Wayne, I saw yours, so I'm, I'm anxious to hear it. But uh, mine – Deals again with uh, the team Red Star, the Red Star team in Kunlun. Uh, apparently, over in China, uh, the building that they uh, and and it escapes me the name of it, but it's in Beijing. The building where they play the hockey uh, uh, is, I think, an eighteen nineteen thousand seat arena. Uh, but they have festivities going on at the beginning of the season, and so every year they cannot play for the first like six or seven games of the year. Do, so this this year was there was there yeah, last year that's what has taken place. Is it, that the same this year? That happened again. That's correct. It happened again. So our, what's uh, the reason the, for that? Uh I I don't I, the article never really centered on why that is, but apparently something's going on in Beijing where they're using that arena at the at the start of the KHL season. And so they have to play they played seven games on the road. They go on a road trip, a long road trip, and they play. They played seven games and then came back home. Kind of like the, the way game, Carolina does. Yeah, like every the year. game that they played, the first home game wasn't even in Beijing. It was in uh, uh, Shanghai. So uh, the article that I wrote was entitled, or that I read was entitled, Philstrom. Zapolsky defeat Red Star, Jokerit four, Kunlun one. Saturday's only game saw KHL action come to China for the first time this season, but Kunlun Red Star was unable to celebrate its homecoming with a victory. Additionally, uh, excuse me, admittedly, the Beijing team didn't get all the way home after seven road games to begin the the campaign. Just like last season, the fall brings uh, other demands on Red Star's home in the Chinese capital. And this game was actually played in Shanghai. But uh, let's see, buoyed by Kunlun's bright start, 
to the 2017-18 campaign, spectator numbers, and especially spectator noise, was up on what we saw in the capital uh, megacity last year, offering more evidence that this game is making progress in the People's Republic. On the ice, though, Kunlun was undone by a combination of Ryan Zapolsky's goaltending and two goals from Antti Filstrom. Uh, Laroski, Laroski kept uh, kept Jokerit in the game uh, when Red Star was in the ascending early on, uh, locking up the game until his team grabbed the lead midway through the encounter. That opening goal came on the power play, which Nicholas Jensen found some space in the deep slot and put a wrister into the top corner. Then Marco Antilla made it three, uh, two to nothing early on in the third. Pavel uh, Varobes, and I hope I said that right, uh, first ever, uh, first ever career goal in the KHL gave the Red Star team hope, but Philstrom extinguished that with a de- <laughs> with a deflected shot from a tight angle to make it three to one, and also scored an empty netter to seal the deal for Jokerit. So Jokerit Helsinki, uh, they defeated Kunlun, and Kunlun seems to be coming back down to earth too. They're five and four the last I saw. So they're dropping in the standings, but uh, doing better than they were last year. Well, good. You know, I don't, have you noticed, and uh, scrolling through the uh, KHL website, and I don't mean to change the subject, but nope, um, that we're unable to view videos. Yeah, I've noticed that this year. They've put they've put the territorial kind of like they Canada does. It says unfortunately, the video is not available in your country. Yeah, you know, if you're trying to sell your game, <laughs> I don't know why they put these these geographic restrictions on on this content. If you're trying to sell the game to an audience, even if it's a worldwide audience, why would you restrict highlight packages? Yeah, I don't know. Just it's just it irks me. And there's really no video now that's available to us. No, I can't find any no so. now i could fire up my i'm wondering if i could fire up my um uh my vpn if i can vpn into russia and and get those videos i haven't tried that yet but but i'm not going to bother trying um it's it's just aggravating the nhl does it um tsn in canada we can't ever get their videos yeah i don't know if anybody who's listening to us it, it has anything to do with tsn i'm like come on you're trying to you're trying to spread your message uh, you know around the world why are you locking up this stuff? Yeah. We're, we're fans. We want to see this. <laughs> That's good. We want to see this stuff. Come on. That's right. I, I know it has all after, uh, all has to do with advertising. By restricting it, um, you, you know, the advertisers are not getting views that, you know, it's it's a whole thing with advertising. I know what it is, but it's just frustrating. Yeah. All right. So, yeah, good thing with... Uh, with the Chinese team that they're they're growing their game and of course having two NHL games there this this fall is going to going to be even better. Now, hey Wayne, people. is is that going to be at the at the arena? I believe uh, so. Where so. Kunlun plays yeah, and that place does seat a lot of people. Yeah. Uh I think we reported on it last year that's like 18,000 or something. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. So good. All right, well my story is also out of the KHL and it's about a former NHL player, Jack Skilly. Yeah. Uh, signed with the KHL's Dynamo Minsk uh, this year after playing several years in the NHL. Uh, and he made his debut, uh, it doesn't say, I have it here. Oh, September 11th. Uh, he made his debut with Dynamo Minsk and got a goal and two assists in his first KHL game. In oh, a, yeah, in a three to one win against Tractor. And that was their first home win of the year. Um, now about Jack Skill or Skilly, I think it's Skilly is the way you say it. Mm-hmm. Um, he was a first round draft pick, seventh overall in the 2005 NHL draft. So he is a, a fa- fairly old player. He's 30 years old now. Uh, right winger shoots right. Um, he played well. He has a total of 368 uh, games of NHL experience. Uh, last year he played for the Canucks, 55 games, nine points. Mm-hmm. Uh, 12 penalty minutes, uh, and then uh, basically been bouncing around the league. He's also played for the Colorado Avalanche, Columbus Blue Jackets, Florida Panthers, Chicago Blackhawks, uh, and that's it. Uh, he played for the University of Wisconsin back in his college days. Uh, he's got uh, some time in the AHL. Uh, he played for the uh, U.S. National Development Program, under-18 team, before he went to the University of Wisconsin. 
Uh, so he's uh, he's been bouncing around. He's got you know 368 games of the NHL experiences. Definitely nothing to um, sneeze at. Uh, yeah. 84 career points, 43 goals, 41 assists in the NHL, 118 penalty minutes. So more of a role player at the NHL level. Um, but uh, obviously he decided that uh, he's probably not going to, especially with his advanced age, probably was not going to make an NHL roster this year. So he decided to sign in the KHL. And look how <laughs> first game yeah. he scores three points. So Yeah, that's great so, news. Yep. So great news for a former NHLer. Yeah. I like to, anytime I run across a former NHLer doing something in that league. Um, I like to highlight it for sure. Show that those guys can still play. <laughs> now, in terms of the KHL, uh, take a look at the statistical leaders. Uh, Nigel Dawes is still leading the KHL in uh, points. He's got 16 points in eight games, 12 goals. Uh, Kovalchuk is second. Nikita Gusev is third. Of course, it's very tight. Gusev has 14. Kovalchuk, 15 points. Lyndon Vey has uh, 13 points in only eight games. Uh, Pavel Datsuk. Yeah, I don't know. Who's that guy? Yeah. I've never heard of him before. <laughs> Who, who's Pavel Datsuk? He's got 13 yeah. points to start off the year. Sergei Mozyakin is off to another strong start. 12 points in 10 games. So uh, those are your uh, le- scoring leaders in the KHL. All right. Let's move on to our picks of the week. Yes, sir. And you have a good one. Um, can't remember off the top of my head what it was, so I'm just going to let you go you, ahead you, with it. You want me to go? Okay, yep. I'll, I'll I'll get this get this one through. Listen, when my wife and I, when my wife, I was I taught her about hockey, uh, and I over the years since we've been married, and she is now probably a bigger fan than I am. <laughs> uh, you know, <laughs> we need to have her on the show sometime. You know that yeah, we should we should we should have her on a, uh, and especially for this particular pick of the week because when she first started watching hockey uh she didn't like scott hartnell she just didn't he, he was he's he you know he's been known to be a dirty player he's the I, type of player that can rub play people the wrong way i i could see that yeah you can definitely get under your skin yep. but as the years have gone by and we've watched him and we've learned that she didn't like his long hair either <laughs> but uh, you know <laughs> He's changed. He's really, but he's he's become older, more mature, maybe. But I've I've always had, you know, I've had a healthy respect for the Flyers and their teams. Uh, if you watch, they're they're they've really uh, they're a good team. Uh, but but we didn't really follow him very much when he was in Nashville. But he spent his first six years in Nashville. Then he goes to Philadelphia and Columbus, et cetera, et cetera. Um, the bottom line is he is now back in Nashville for a season. He signed a one-year contract, yep. and he he left uh, Columbus, is going back to Nashville where he started. And there happens to be a gentleman there uh, by the name of Craig Ball, who is the uh, the resident uh, uh, locker room attendant, I guess, for the Nashville Predators. Yep. And he has been in that position for quite some time. As a matter of fact, he was in that position – when Scott Hartnell originally played for the Predators. Yep. And so here is this guy who has been with the team for uh, for years, uh, and all of a sudden uh, the mascot has got the camera running, and one of the players from the Predators organization comes up and says, hey, come on over here. I want you to see somebody who just came in the locker room today. Well, you know, Craig Baugh apparently developed quite a friendship and relationship with Scott Hartnell. If you watch the video, he sees him for the first time in the Predators uh, lo- uh, weight room uh, for years. And uh, the 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 reun- reuniting of those two is really something I encourage you go on to NHL.com and, and watch this video. But this one actually did have a quick story with it. And I wanted to read it for you. But I encourage everyone to go on NHL.com, read this, uh, watch the video. It's really uh, touching. But the the title of the article is Scott Hartnell has big bear hug for an old friend in Nashville. Brothers don't shake hands. Brothers got a hug. Scott Hartnell's um, return to the Nashville Predators after 10 seasons away turned emotional when he finally saw Craig Ball, the man they call partner, a longtime locker room attendant for the team. In a video captured by Nash, the Predators mascot, Hartnell, who signed a one-year deal to return to Nashville, where he spent his first six NHL seasons, is pointed out to Ball 
while working on the weight room, while working in the weight room. Baugh couldn't believe it. Hartnell quickly went, uh, and he, he does, he rushes over to the edge to, 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 to hug his buddy. Quickly, uh, quickly went to the door uh, with an extra large bear hug and an emotional bro for his old friend. Welcome home, buddy, Baugh said during the emotional embrace. It was Hartnell back in 2012 while visiting Nashville with the Flyers who singled out Baugh saying, he just puts a big smile on your face. For Baugh, the feeling, as the saying goes, is mutual. So uh, that was it. Uh, I like uh, Scott Hartnell's top guy uh, in my books. Uh, you know, I've, I've watched uh, several stories on him. And uh, so I know I feel like I know a little bit about him to, to be able to tell you about him. But he, this is a touching thing. It it's, takes 50 seconds, but it's worth your time. And you can learn a little bit about the guy as well. Yeah, it's so. a very it's it's a very short video. I saw the video, and uh, yeah, it was it was a very nice moment for them. And these locker room tenant guys, these are these are the guys that make the player's life a little bit easier. You know, they're on the road, they're they're traveling all over the place. These locker room attendants, and they tend to stick around for a long, long time. Yeah, um, and uh, you know, every team's got one of these guys, and uh, um, yeah, they get they get close to the players. They have good relationships with them, and. Uh, and you know, I've often heard that Scott Hartnell off the ice or, you know, on, on a sp specific team is a very, you know, great guy, you know, yeah. gr great personality, funny, you know, you yeah. name it as much as we like to hate him as, uh, uh you know, I, I hated him when he was with the flyers, when they were playing <laughs> against the Bruins, you know, and, yeah. and, you know, because he gets under your skin, you know, that, that much, but usually off the ice, those kind of guys are usually, Pretty good guys, and yeah, I did see the video, and it's it's a nice moment to see those two guys get reunited. Yeah, yeah, like they're old friends that hadn't seen each other in a long time. It was good. Looking, so thank you, Wayne. I'm looking for um, I'm looking for an article. I'm actually on the Boston Red Sox website, looking for an article that goes with my pick of the week, and I'm not finding it right off the top. I wanted to find out how much they raise. But anyway, my pick of the week is about a story where the um, the Panthers, the Red Sox, the Tampa Bay Devil, De uh, actually, they're not the Devil Rays anymore, the Tampa Bay Rays and the Boston Bruins. So two baseball teams, two hockey teams, all partner together to help Hurricane Irma, or help raise money for Hurricane Irma relief. Uh, the Red Sox, the Rays, the Bruins, and the Panthers have partnered to raise funds for Florida as Hurricane Irma closes in on the region. This, of course, this article was written just before the hurricane hit. Donations will be collected at all Fenway Park gates tomorrow, Sunday, September 10th, before and during the 1.35 p.m. game against the Rays. Helping with the collection will be players from the Red Sox, Rays, Bruins, and Panthers. The Panthers were moved to the Boston area to wait out the hurricane near their American Hockey League affiliate. Uh, donations will support the Red Cross relief efforts that may be needed in the Florida, Florida area. As, as it came, you know, they definitely did need those those donations. Florida is the home of the Red Sox spring training facility, JetBlue Park, which is actually in Fort Myers, one of the cities hit hard. Uh, and the Tampa Bay Rays also are in that city for their spring training facility. Uh, and uh, their regular season ballpark, uh, Charlotte Sports Park and Tropicana Field, and the Florida Panthers Arena, the BB&T Center, which is in Sunrise, Florida. Um, but anyway, those four teams got together at Fenway, and there's pictures. Uh, uh, I saw pictures tweeted out, and I don't have them right in front of me, but it showed um, the whole line. They Basically, they, all the players of these four teams were outside. Um, I think it's Yawkey Way. Um, there's a street that's right outside of Fenway Park. I don't. You've you ever been a game there? I've never been to Fenway no. Park. Oh okay. my goodness, would I love to go one day? Well, I've, I've been. been. I, yeah, I've I've been to many many games. It's been a long time since I've been there. But one of the streets right outside the entrance of Fenway Park is closed off to vehicular traffic uh, before and after games. It's pedestrian only, and and of course all the food vendors set up, and it basically becomes part of the ballpark. Really, is is what it does. It's you know it's food vendors, you know uh, memorabilia, you name it. Well, these players were milling about the crowd during the pregame of that, and basically carrying buckets or you know whatever, raising money. And there's there's pictures out there with Zdeno Chara, and I think Tuca might have been there. I don't have the pictures right in front of me, but. Several players from uh, all four organizations, the two different baseball teams and the, 
the two uh, hockey teams, were out basically milling about the crowd, raising money for um, for Hurricane Irma relief, which was which is very nice. Uh, uh, yeah. very nice to see the, these players just just circulating in the crowd, just just you know, like anyone else. Of course, awesome. guy a guy like Char is going to stand out. <laughs> You know, yeah. he's, he's way bigger than everybody else. But <laughs> but there was a lot of uh, – and I was trying to find an article on the Red Sox website because, you know, the, this took place at their ballpark. And I don't uh, – I don't have it um, – I don't have it queued up, so I wasn't able to find it. But anyway, it was it was a good story just to see, you know, players from several different organizations teaming up together to um, – to raise money for a good cause. For right. Sure. That is and, really good. And again, our hearts go out to anybody who suffered severe damages as a result of the, of those storms. I know the Florida Keys got hit really hard. Yeah. I saw an article yeah. today, 25% of the buildings on the Keys are totally destroyed. So, yeah. Boy, that's terrible. So, yeah. yeah. Just hopefully that, <laughs> that it's mostly vacation houses that got lost. I know you don't want to uh, talk that way, but... Hopefully it was mostly vacation houses and not people's permanent homes that got lost, but I'm sure there were plenty of those. Yeah. All right. So that is pretty much it, unless you have anything else you want to add. No, it's... I think we're pretty much done. We've been yammering on here for almost a couple hours now, so... Yeah, we knocked it out. We did. Another great week. So looking ahead to next week, we've got... Um, why don't we do the Metro division next week? Okay. And then we'll finish with the, um, with the Atlantic. Um, Sounds good. That'll give you a chance to talk about your Rangers. Yes. <laughs> we'll, we'll, uh, we'll definitely get that, uh, that talk in. And our local Carolina Hurricanes. That's so that's right. By then, both teams will, will have played, or all the teams in that division will have played one or two preseason games. Might be able to talk a little preseason hockey there. So yeah, that's cool. we're tentatively scheduled for the uh, next available stream or the next uh, live stream anyway. Same time, Wednesday the 20th, about 6 p.m. Eastern is when we usually record the show. And uh, barring any changes to either of our schedules, that's probably the time that we'll do it. Um, we may do it later in the evening or possibly even uh, the following day if if I end up having to work too late. Um, also, I wanted to touch on uh, the Fantasy Hockey League that we're going to be getting going that's going to be tied to the show. Um, I'm going to be doing a lot of work this week on that now that – because I'm also involved in fantasy football now that the football leagues are up and going that I'm in, involved in day to day, you know, things calm down with that. Now it's time to get things ramped up with the fantasy hockey league. And actually, Steve and I were talking off the air about what we're going to do um, because of the fact we've got to come up with a draft. First of all, I need to fill all uh, 14 slots. And I haven't really figured out yet how many slots I still got open. So if you are interested in joining the Fantasy Hockey League, get me an email ASAP to um, feedback at the uh and we can get you added to the list. And if you've already emailed me, you don't need to email me again. I've got it. I just haven't responded to anything. I just haven't had time to, to do it. Um, I will get back to you and get you time slotted. Uh, just a couple of details to get us going. Uh, it's going to be a fantasy hockey league of 14 teams, I think. We may stretch it to 16 if we have enough interest, um, but it'll be 14 teams. Each team will carry 20 players on the, on the roster, uh, 20 to 22, somewhere in that neighborhood. Um, and the starting group will be roughly 10 starters. Uh, no, around 14 starters, I think, is what we do. I don't have the details right in front of me. But the most important details, um, it is going to be a pay league. Um, it's going to be 50 bucks for the season, uh, and you'll have to get it into us before the start of the draft. The draft date is tentatively set at uh, on October 1st, uh, which is three days before opening night. I want to do the draft as late as possible so that any players that get injured during the preseason are not going to screw over your fantasy team. So that's why we do the draft that late. So the draft will be uh, October 1st, probably in the evening. Uh, it's all going to be done online. We use the CBS uh, Hockey Commissioner product that they have. Uh, everything's done online. It's a fantastic product. I've always been happy with it. Um, I've never been happy with the Yahoo and the ESPN and whatnot because um, I like to create my own rules. Um, once you get in, uh, I will need 
um, you know, your email address and I'll get you set up and get an invite to the league and, and go from there. Um, so 50 bucks for the season. We're going to do the draft on October 1st, sometime in the evening. Um, I'm thinking somewhere in the neighborhood of 7 PM Eastern, uh, somewhere around there, plus or minus a couple of hours. And, um, we'll have the draft, but Steve and I on the, we're planning on what date would we say the 19th, 19th. Steve and I are going to get together to come up with the draft order. Uh, obviously, when you join the league, you don't know exactly when you're going to draft, and we're going to do it complete lottery style. So what we're going to do is I'm going to get a fish bowl or a big bowl, big enough to hold 14 to 16 uh, ping pong balls, and we're going to write on the ping pong balls uh, the team names. Uh, and what we'll do is we'll start at number 14 or 16, whatever it is that we, you know. And we'll we'll pick out of that. Okay, picking 14th, we have, boom, this team. Picking 13th, boom, this team. And we'll go all the way up to number one. We're going to do that. Uh, we're going to record it, put it on uh, our YouTube channel. Uh, we'll probably stream it live if we can get it because we're going to meet at a local restaurant here in Durham, North Carolina. Um, actually, it's going to be a pretty cool spot to, to do this. Uh, we're going to be at uh, a local restaurant that overlooks the uh, ballpark where the Durham Bulls play. So we'll have that in the background as, as a nice sight line. But we're going to draft. We're going to do the draft order. Uh, live on YouTube. And then, of course, if you miss the live stream, it will be recorded and it will be available to watch on YouTube. Um, so between now and then, that's only six days from now. I need to get all 14 to 16 spots in the um, Fantasy Hockey League filled. So if you've been thinking about it and you haven't emailed me yet, you need to get into me because we will go ahead and get that filled. If all goes to plan, we'll do the lottery uh, on the 19th to determine who picks when and then the draft itself will be on the 1st of October and we'll do that live uh, through the software the CBS software uh, online so uh, that's the details for now uh, as you get your names in we will go ahead and get further details out to you if you're going to actually be involved in the league um, other than that that's pretty much it that sounds good, Wayne. I'm looking so, forward to being with you in Durham next week. And uh, this should be an interesting thing. I'm going to learn a little bit about fantasy hockey because I've never <laughs> been involved in it before. But it yep. should be a lot of fun. Well, the, the first and foremost, you're going to need one of these. <laughs> Your uh, hockey news pool guide. At least that's, <laughs> that's what I use anyway. That and you know, watching lots and lots of games uh, will tell me uh, who's going to do what. But, yeah, it's fun just a fun way to and gives me a uh, just another reason to watch more hockey not that i need another reason but <laughs> <laughs> all right so that is pretty much it again if you want to uh email us uh, our email address is feedback at the and you can tweet us i'm at wayne halley nine steve is at sball 504 man you can reach us through our facebook page at facebook.com slash the hockey nuts and our youtube channel is at the hockey nuts.com slash youtube um, so with that, we will go ahead and wrap it up. And until next week, we will uh, catch you then. Have a good night, Wayne. All right, you too. <laughs> <laughs>